So we've got plenty of time for questions now, and maybe we can drill a bit deeper into what these guys are doing on farm. We have got a roaming mic just here. So, do you have any questions? Goodness me, where do we start? Right, okay. I think the first hand went up was the gentleman in the check shirt. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Really interesting presentation. Um, John Turner from the Pasture Fed Livestock Association. Um, I've got two technical questions and then an overall question, if that's okay. Um, the first of the technical questions to Rob Richmond is um, about the actual mix that you put in in this diverse sword. I'd be really interested just to know what that particular mixture is, um, find out a bit more about it. And to Robert Craig, um, the actual size of paddock and the number of cows that you've got on, that seems to be critical, and you've been through that process of making that work, so that would be really useful for a technical one. Um, but the overall sort of question I wanted to put to you both, and towards the end of Rob Craig, you mentioned economics and getting that right. We're still in a position, I mean, with quotas going, we're now in a position where milk price is used to try and depress supply. And it seems to me that, you know, if, if we put the milk price down by 5p, you're still producing the same amount of milk next week and the week after because that's the nature of the production. And how do we get to a point at which you're getting a fair price for milk and the supply of milk isn't being controlled by price but some of the mechanism so that you've got uh, money to reinvest not only in your business but sort of those of future generations? Long question, sorry, but... Okay. Um, right, I'll, um, I kick off? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer the economics question, really. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 maybe food production shouldn't be left to the markets. You know, maybe this is too fundamentally important to the, to the planet, if you like, to be left to the markets. Maybe that's the solution at the end of the day. But nothing's going to change at the moment, is it? You know, we're going into a more and more volatile future. It's, it's you know, the harsh realities of supply and demand. That is where we're going to be. And, uh, you know, we're surrounded by a lot of countries in Europe that are, are really ready for the end of quotas. And we're going to see, you know, a lot more. That's why it's really difficult to predict anything like short term, because things could get a hell of a lot worse in 12 months' time than they are now. It, it's hard to, hard to believe, but we're already really at a milk price that's fairly well below break even for the vast majority of dairy farmers. So how could things get any worse? So you'd have to assume that the consequence of that is at some point we're going to get less supply and that's how the market will, the market will work but you know will it will the banks stand behind farmers you know the, New Zealand at the moment they're in just as big a predicament but the, the thing the, the sort of the news out of New Zealand is the banks will stand behind them for a year so their production is going to stay there because they all think that at some point things are going to turn around and go back again so but we've got to start to reevaluate the whole sort of food system, really. It, 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 and I think it's probably way too important to be left to the markets, to be fair. And I don't think we're going to realize that until it's way too late, mind you, but uh, that's a bit fatalist. But, you know, I, I just think there's so much good sentiment about, but until we actually, somebody's actually got to take leadership and actually develop policy on this. And until we get there, or we build a big enough movement of change and people actually, you know, educated consumers will drive change. So it's either one or the other at some point. But um, just on the size of paddock, um, yeah, I mean, it's critical for us to make the thing work that, that we're basically removing that feed of grass at once. And, and there's, a, there's a range of opinions there. There are some farmers that would prefer to put the cows into a paddock for 36 hours, and then you, you sort of uh, less dominant cows, your heifers in the herd, are actually, are, they're only getting pinched once, if you like, in that 36 hours. They're going back and they've always got plenty of feed. What seems to work for us are 12-hour breaks. Uh, it gets the cows away from the milking parlour. They don't loiter. You know, they're ready for a new break of grass. There's a little bit more management in there, uh, but we're, we're, we're supplementing as well, so it's not purely pasture, so that's maybe why that works particularly well. But um, we, There's more management, but we've got a lot more control over that, um, and that enables us to get uh, the most out of that, um, out of that grass break. I think I'll do the same again. Um, if we look at the business side of the dairy industry, I think a large amount of it is down to lack of innovation. Milk is quite a boring product. It's in the supermarket as milk, cream, butter, cheese. There's been no innovation, no will to sort of sex milk up, 
try and get it to compete with fizzy drinks or whatever, to try and get younger consumers to drink more to drive the market, whether that's due to complacency in the industry, whether it's due to lack of will with the supermarkets because they like milk there as a draw, to draw people in, I don't know. But I think in this country, we still import a lot of milk, even though we're paid on depending on what the world market prices is. And I think there's, there's a lot of scope to drive a lot more um, high value products, but it needs a will further up the chain to start and, and move that, which would give a, a securer milk price. In terms of the pastures that we are growing, there's a mixture of grasses in there. The dominant one is Coxfoot. Um, we do have a bit of rye grass, um, fescues, Timothy, a mixture of clovers, uh, both white, um, some red in there, and then other legumes such as the trefoils, samphoin, and a mix of herbs including chicory, plantain, burnet, yarrow. Um, and it, it's pretty much um, based on a standard mix, but we have tweaked it for our situation over the years as we've gained experience with it. Thank you. Uh, seconds last row, just on your right. Thank you. Hi there, Andrew Brewster, a farmer from Scotland. I recently heard something from a, a bee farmer in America by Greg Judy, which I thought might interest you. Is he was talking about spreading raw milk on the pasture. It was about a gallon per hectare, I think, and that gets the, like the, the fungi and bacteria working and building up organic matter in the soil. So I was wondering, like, when the milk price is really low, is doing that and then re recycles your nutrients, and then in time, when the milk price is higher, you can sort of reap that reward. It was just a small amount on the pasture for my interest, some people here. I don't have a lot of experience with that. Um, when you said that, that kind of the image of the, what, the French, what the French farms tend to do when they've got a gripe with the with their European Parliament do, isn't it? That's a, yeah, it should be pretty, um, pretty high in organic matter in, in France, shouldn't it? I, d I mean, I don't know whether you want to comment on that. No, we did some, um, we had some waste milk to get rid of, and I actually mixed some of that at, I think it was about 20 litres a hectare, and sprayed it on several paddocks, <coughs> and you could actually see the difference this was um, late in the autumn, and you could see the difference where that had gone the following spring. And I think, again, it's just an energy source for the bacteria in the, in the soil. So it, it's, it's all a case of feeding the soil microbes because they do the work for you in, in producing and releasing the nutrients for crop growth. Thank you. Just on your left there. Thank you. Hello, uh, Trevor Mansfield, Soil Association. Thanks, really interesting presentations and really interesting to see the, you know, the differences in approach. I just particularly wondered whether each of you think each other's systems would work on your farms or whether they're you know, particularly sort of place specific. Yeah, good question. I, I, I mean, I'm, I've just become enlightened really to all of this. Uh, you know, um, so, you know, why wouldn't it work, really? <clears throat> I mean, I've, <clears throat> sorry, I've, <clears throat> I've experienced quite a bit of this sort of thinking now, but coming from a really conventional, practical farm, farming background, that, and quite typical, I think, and, I mean, Robert will certainly agree to this. Robert's just done his Nuffield Scholarship and, and has encountered a lot of the similar sort of arguments, and it's, it's quite, you know, it's, it's almost unmoving, it's a moving thing, you know, when you, discover that what you may be doing isn't as good as what you thought it was. And there's a whole load of, and I'm struggling actually to come to terms with the fact that we've got these wonderful scientists around the world. I mean, you think of New Zealand, you think of all the wonderful grassland research that's going on there, Moor Park in Ireland, there's some really clever people there. But they're, they're ignoring a lot of what we've been talking about in the last couple of days about the soil and the, and the, the biology and all of that stuff. So, I mean, yeah, why wouldn't it work, you know? Uh, and I think, you know, we've, we've got to be open-minded. We've got to start adapting some of this new thinking. And it isn't necessarily new, I know, to, to a lot of you guys, but 
you know, be aware that it is quite radical to a lot of us that we're really conventional. And we thought we were doing it right. I mean, I thought I was doing it right, to be fair. But, you know, <laughs> there, there's always a different way, isn't there? When I first started at Manor Farm, we were growing ryegrass and nitrogen. We converted, or started conversion in September 2007. We started growing the deep rooting lays. Um, the first ones would be planted autumn 2005. The main reason for doing that was we're on a dry farm uh, on the top of the Cotswolds to give us um, more drought resistance. The ryegrass, a lot of the farm at the time was in a three-year rotation of Westerwolds ryegrass, winter wheat, spring barley, conventionally run. The um, ground for spring barley was autumn ploughed, so a lot of that land was run down and actually switching to the deep root in lays, removing nitrogen, we were actually producing more grass doing that than we were with uh, ryegrass and nitrogen in our situation, basically because those soils had got run down. And we know that um, over the years, as we've run this system, we've lifted our organic matters quite considerably. Um, now we've got to where we are. Um, I said that the ryegrass lay that we're growing in that one field, even without nitrogen, is in its first couple of years, which is the ryegrass's most productive years, matching the, um, the diverse sward, but it's a much more seasonal production rather than the diverse sward giving us an even production throughout the year, which for our system is more beneficial. Okay, metal at the back. Yeah, thanks, team of Roberts. Um, yeah, Will Armitage, an organic and conventional dairy farmer from Leicestershire. Um, really, to Rob Richmond, what sort of stocking rates are you running? Um, tons of dry matter grown, and then also how we actually measure and evaluate the quality of feed that we feed into the cows. But Rob Craig, you may like to join in on that as well. Yeah, um, this year on the um, grazing platform with spring calving cows, we've run at 1.9 cows per hectare. At the same time, half of that grazing platform has been um, cut for silage. And that silage um, wouldn't be far off feeding the cows through the winter, we have, we have used extra silage elsewhere. Uh, our intention over the next three years is to increase stocking rates over the farm to somewhere between 1.8 and 2 cows per hectare. Um, and that's for 365 day feed production. We've fed um, round about a ton of concentrates this year and output per cow has been about five and a half thousand. Measuring um, the sward, I threw the plate meter away when we switched to the diverse swords because chicory has a habit of bolting and sticking stems up, so it was telling me lies most of the year. Um, so most of the uh, Grazing decisions is done by eye. Uh, if they're grazing too tight, they get more the next day, and if they're leaving too much, we tighten them up a bit. Uh, the measurement of the actual production of that one sward was done by um, cutting and weighing the material to get the comparison between the two. Yeah, we obviously know about that, how we measure, because I sort of explained that, but I, I think where you're getting at is how do we know what we've got, essentially, isn't it? Um, and, uh, we do do grass samples, you know, we send grass away to get sampled, we get a, a page full of results, and we kind of assume that everything is constant. We know the sort of the dry matter, the protein, and the, the sort of the energy value of that grass, but we don't know a lot else, I guess. You know, we don't, we don't really know whether, that, whether we're in decline, whether that grass is worth any more or any less than it was 20 years ago. I mean, our job is to put, ideally, a sort of a sward of 
about 2,700 to 3,000 kilograms of dry matter in front of the cows and to clean that down to a residual of about 1,500, 1,600 um, of good, young, leafy grass. You know, that's how the thing works. Um, but so far as evaluation of that grass, I guess, you know, there's quite a gap there, really. Uh, Patrick Holden, following on the same discussion, um, Robert, I, we've had a conversation about how you are not able economically, as you just said, to change your system at the moment because of the, um, the, the economic environment. I wonder whether you've done some speculation as to what your, given that I realized on my own farm that I reckon I can take my stocking rate to another level just by applying some of the principles that you're already applying. Have you thought about what your potential stocking rate might be uh, if you weaned yourself off your addiction to nitrogen and went on to clover? Um, and, and, uh, and, and in relation to that, <coughs> supposing we were to try to change the economic environment by taxing nitrogen fertilizer, have you done any speculation as to what level of price nitrogen fertilizer would have to be to price you out of your addiction? That's a really, really, really good question, Patrick, as I would expect. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, though, if nitrogen became, and I don't know what the number is, really, but if, if it became so unacceptably expensive, boy, would you see a change in the way that we produce feed, you know? Uh, you know, we all, we all thought there a few years ago, peak oil had gone, there was never going to be any cheap energy again, but, you know, look what's happened to the price of oil and, hey, presto, nitrogen fertilizers you know, getting cheaper again, isn't it? So, I mean, the, the answer is I don't, I don't really know. So far as stocking rates, we'd probably have to lose at least a cow to the hectare. So currently we're on sort of a cow to the acre, two and a half cows to the hectare. I guess we'd have to drop down, I don't know, did you mention the stocking rate? We're, answer? Well, we'd probably we're, have to we're get, on about 1.9 at the moment. The period, I think, and I think that's achievable probably for us, but it's a period of change we'd have to go through and the economics of that change that are actually quite challenging, really. Um, because of, I, I think, my circumstances, but I'm not that untypical, to be fair. You know, we were determined to grow a business that delivered on a lot of fronts. Lifestyle was one of them. So, we you know, we've got a lot of staff now. We've got a big-ish business. Uh, and we're heavily leveraged. You know, there's no getting away from that. So the economics are really important. Um, but, you know, I'm open-minded enough to realize that what we're doing is not right. And at some point, we're going to have to bite the bullet and change what we're doing. It, that's, of course, much easier on a home farm because I'm in charge on the partnership farm. Uh, Dolphin Bee might be more of a challenge because I've got to persuade someone else to do it there. So, uh. Can I just come in on that one? Um, when I was on Nuffield tour, I was west of Melbourne on some dairy farms there. There was two farms there that were regarded in the area as the ones to look up to. They had centre pivot irrigation. They were applying over 300 kilos of nitrogen a hectare, high levels of phosphate. Their grass had started to lose its vigor, was starting to look yellow. They cut nitrogen out overnight, switched to using compost, switched to putting dirty water through the center pivots, and actually were growing more grass. The grass was better quality, they had less health issues with the cows. Um, and when I was there, he was in his third year of doing so. He had a thousand tons of stuff off his own farm. He bought in a thousand tons of chicken manure, a thousand tons of green waste, and paid someone else to make the compost, and then bought the equipment to spread it. And his total cost was half of what he was spending on fertilizer previously. And he, he felt he was in a much better place. And that, to me, was a much more a much better example of what could be achieved because this was a conventional man hooked on his fertilizer that had changed rather than someone that was um, convinced organics was the way sort of thing. Um, it's Christine Page. I've got a small uh, micro dairy um, in South Shropshire um, producing raw milk. Um, I want to go 100% pasture fed. Um, I've been trying the herbal lays, so my question is for Rob Richmond. How long do the herbal lays last before you have to reseed? And can you reseed, uh, reseed with just like a more uni drill, or do you have to plough each time? Because I'd rather go down the holistic route of not turning the soil over. 
As for how long they last, I'm not sure yet. We now have some lathes that have been down for seven years. Um, they've gradually become more grass dominant. Talking to Alan Savory last year, he reckoned that between sort of four and seven years, production gradually declines. After seven years, it becomes more permanent pasture. If it's managed right, production will keep improving year on year. Um, the ones we've got are still producing well. There's some of them we are going to keep in long term to see what happens. Others that aren't producing so well, we will pull out, but we tend to cultivate, put kale in, which fills the gap through the winter for us, and then reseed the following spring. And I think with the herbal lays, from experience, you tend to need to create bare soil to help get the herbs and the smaller seeds established. The grasses will establish, the clovers might, but a lot of the herbs won't establish going straight into a competitive environment. Henry Bagnell, question to first Rob. <laughs> um, on your rise diagram, you had uh, a welfare um, issue. Uh, how are you addressing that welfare issue? What are your plans, and are they linked to your farming system? Yeah, that, <coughs> Sorry. that wasn't my rise diagram. That was an example. I, I, um, I've, got, I've got mine through, but I only just got the password for it so I can download it actually yesterday from the, the lady that did it. So now our biggest issue was um, the fact that we were basically a monoculture. We had ryegrass everywhere, and the, and the, the effects of using nitrogen fertilizer. The rest was pretty good, really. In, in, um, yeah, I mean, the welfare, I mean, I'm, I don't know, reasonably conventional welfare-wise. Uh, this is the one big issue I would have with, such as uh, Philip Limbury and, you know, his sort of thinking on welfare, that although we're grazing 250, 60 days a year, we have a house period. We have 60 inches of rainfall in Cumbria. You know, you don't want, you don't want cows out in Cumbria at this time of year, and my cubicle shed isn't that much different, really, from the guy that's got his cows in a shed, 365. So... Um, but there isn't, so far as that evaluation went, there wasn't really a weakness there. Uh, there was a, a bit of an um, economic weakness that we, you know, that we know that's part of how we've grown the business. And, and, but the big weakness was nitrogen fertilizer. Metal on your right. Thanks. Dave Stanley, PFLA. Thanks to both Roberts there for very illuminating presentations, much appreciated. Just following through uh, on Patrick's point on what you might do, just a quick comment, an energy tax sorts all, including that energy em embodied in uh, imports. Question to uh, Robert Richmond. You said you're importing straw and the like. Any idea what percentage of your nutrients you're actually importing onto your farm? Right. Mm. <coughs> in a word, no. Um, we, um, this year we spread about a thousand tons of compost um, and that was composted farmyard manure. We mixed some of that as we mixed it up, we mixed um, extra straw into it, but the rest of it has a fair bit of straw in it, but it's farmyard manure. We'll buy in um, about 1,500 big square bales, so 1,200 tons of straw. Uh, no, I'm talking rubbish. 600 tons of straw. Um, so that, that's the sort of tonnage we're pulling in. It's about a ton an acre of, of straw. I think you're quite right, you know, an energy tax would help sort the problem out, but the waters are really murky. I mean, that's why I did quite a bit of research before, you know, this event to try and sort out in my own mind, is there a really clear definition of what is 
sensible dairy farming in terms of energy and carbon footprint. You know. it's, really, it's really, there's too many assumptions in there yet. We don't seem to have a system of working out what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. Okay, this is going to have to be the last question, I think, I'm afraid. Good morning. Thank you for your excellent presentations uh, to both of you. I just wanted to ask you a question about the, the quality or the difference uh, that you may have noticed in the end product, that is the milk itself. And it's, I asked the question set in this context, that Coca-Cola is about to move into, so many people in this room might know this, uh, in the United States, they're moving into selling milk in retail. I should explain, by the way, that my name is Ed Martin, and I work for a producer organization in Kent on behalf of Kent County Council. So I represent about 250 small producers and growers and farmers. My job is to try and find markets for their products. Uh, Coca-Cola says they're moving into selling milk, but they are, are going to do it on the following basis, of not buying the milk from the big um, mega farms, but from, excuse me, from small family-run farms that are using pasture-fed uh, pasture systems. It's because of the story they want to tell attached to the milk, so they can get a premium price. I don't know that the farmer themselves are going to get a higher price at the farm gate. But in Kent, I've got three members of my organization who make ice cream, and, but all three of them are experiencing astonishing uh, uh, growth in sales. Two are exporting their ice cream, one to the Far East, one to the Gulf States. The markets are saying they want the ice cream made in Kent. That's the story they want to tell their, their market. And uh, my members are having trouble sourcing enough raw material within Kent. So we're looking across the borders now to, to other dairy farms. It's a sort of note of optimism, I hope, in this. But, but also, is there a difference in quality of your end product of the milk you produce as compared to, say, previous systems that didn't employ? Thank you. Um, uh, the focus is completely different. You know, we were, we were just producing standard milk in the past. So we would have been 4% butterfat, 3 3.2% protein, we're actually now quite focused on producing high solids milk, and that is for a manufacturer. Um, and it's taken a long time for the industry to catch up with our intentions, if you like. We're, we're the only country in the world that, uh, that values milk on a per litre basis. Every, every other major dairy producing country in the world uh, values milk on milk solids. Um, so we've actually gone down the New Zealand route, we're producing milk solids, and now we've got two contracts the, the, the litres of milk really have no in involvement in the price, and it's all about kilograms of milk solids that are picked up on the farm every day, not thousands of litres. Um, but so far as the product goes, you know, I don't know enough about the milk, you know, the other inherent benefits of milk to know whether organic milk is better than conventional chemically produced milk or not, or not really. Um, I mean, I have a really, you talked about milk being produced from family farms. I mean, we, had, we were dairy farms of Britain members uh, before they went bankrupt, and they had this initiative where they were selling local milk for a while. And part of their criteria for supplying that local label, it was coming out of Bladen in Newcastle. Uh, and it was, we were within that patch, we could have supplied that. But because I got off my backside and grown a business from 40 cows to then, I think, 150 cows, I, was, I had a too big a herd of cows to supply that market. And I felt, you know, that's really unfair differentiation between, you know, we are where we are. We're getting less and less dairy farms. Inherently, the dairy farms are getting bigger. We can't reinvent the wheel, you know. Um, but so far as what we do, we produce high solids milk. And, and there are loads of advantages all the way through the supply chain of having high solids milk. We're nowhere near big conurbations of population. So, you know, there's less haulage, there's less energy used in the processing uh, in either cheese or, you know, the Nestle factory. And it's really interesting to see how Nestle have completely changed their opinion of, of that process and how they want to define their milk field and how much control they actually want over that really transparent supply chain. That's, that's amazed me, actually, in a very short period of time, the whole thing's turned around. I think the main thing where there's a lot of evidence, certainly coming out of America, is where you've got pasture-fed milk, you've got the change in composition of the omega-3, omega-6 ratio in the milk um, with high levels of grain. It's kind of guesstimated that once you go over 25% of the cow's diet as grain, you're getting much more omega-6 in the milk and less omega-3. And the ideal balance as a foodstuff is a kind of two to one one to one omega three to six ratio, which tends to be produced from the pasture based 
um, dairy cow rather than a high input cow. Thank you very much. I'm afraid it's time to wrap things up, so I'd like to uh, thank everybody for attending the Robert Show uh, and for your, uh, your attendance and your uh, interaction and questions. And I'd like you to join me in thanking the two presenters for some enlightening presentations and answers to their questions. Thank you very much.